In this video, we're going to talk about translation. This is protein synthesis. So remember that we have a DNA sequence that is a gene that will code for an RNA molecule, and that RNA molecule gives the instructions for the amino acid sequence when we form proteins. Where does this occur? So let's have a quick look at the cell. So in the cell, the nucleus contains the DNA, the chromatin, and transcription occurs in the nucleus. Then the messenger RNA molecule is going to leave through a pore and it's going to go find a ribosome. That ribosome can be free in the cytoplasm or it can be on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes are not membrane-bound organelles like the mitochondria or the endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes are composed of proteins and ribosomal RNA. So there are three different kinds of RNA molecules. So before we look at translation, let's just have a quick look at the different types of RNA molecules. So here we have a ribosome. The ribosome has a large subunit and a small subunit. These subunits will come together and assemble around the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA was made from transcription. So this is carrying a nucleotide sequence. Then the ribosome is composed of ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is produced in the nucleolus of the nucleus. Our third type of RNA molecule is called a transfer RNA or a tRNA. These are RNA sequences that are folded up and they carry an amino acid. Every transfer RNA carries its own specific amino acid. Remember that we have 20 amino acids and nine of them are essential, which means that we have to get them from our diet. The rest our cells can produce. There's an important sequence on the transfer RNA and that is called an anticodon. The anticodon is three nucleotides that are going to be complementary to the codons. So the messenger RNA carries a codon sequence. Every three nucleotides is a codon. So then the transfer RNA will bind two specific codon sequences in the messenger RNA. Then we can bring the correct amino acid to form the amino acid sequence. So if we took a transfer RNA molecule and we ironed it out and made it flat, it would look something like this. So it's a single-stranded, remember RNA is single-stranded, but it folds in certain regions and it kind of has this folded structure. The three prime end carries the amino acid. And down here at this end, we have an anticodon sequence. This anticodon sequence is going to match up with a codon. So messenger RNA molecules have the codon, transfer RNA molecules have the anticodon. So in reality, they kind of fold more like this kind of a structure, but the important point is that the anticodon has to match with the codon. So when we have a messenger RNA sequence, and we know what those nucleotides are. We can determine what amino acid matches up with those nucleotides because every living thing follows the same genetic code. Every codon in every living organism is always three nucleotides and there are very specific amino acids that will line up with those nucleotides. So if you were given any RNA sequence, you would be able to look at the sequence whether it came from a human or a mouse or a zebra, and you would be able to determine the exact amino acid sequence. So let's have a look at what a genetic code looks like. There are 64 different possible codons, but remember that we only have 20 amino acids. So there are some codons that will code for the same amino acid. So if we look at this example here, we have three uracils, that codes for phenylalanine. There will be a transfer RNA with an anticodon that will be AAA, and it will carry the phenylalanine amino acid. The codon UUC 
will also code for phenylalanine. So there will be another transfer RNA that is AAG, and that will match up with this codon, and it will be carrying the same amino acid. Another thing that I want to point out is methionine is always the first amino acid. AUG is always the first codon in a messenger RNA molecule. And then over here, these three in red are important as well because they don't code for an amino acid. These are called stop codons. So when a stop codon is encountered in the sequence, there's no transfer RNA that has an anticodon that matches with that. So there's no amino acid. So when translation is going on and a stop codon occurs, then when no transfer RNA comes along, then the process ends. And then the amino acid sequence is complete. So if you were given any messenger RNA sequence, you would be able to use this code to figure out what the amino acids are. So let's look at how the process works with the messenger RNA in the ribosome, and then we'll try a practice question. When translation begins, the small and large subunits of the ribosome assemble around the messenger RNA. The beginning of the messenger RNA is the five prime end. The start codon is always AUG, and that transfer RNA that matches that codon carries the amino acid methionine. This is the only transfer RNA that will begin in the middle of the ribosome. There are three sites in the large subunit of the ribosome, the A site, the P site, and the E site. The A site is where the new transfer RNA comes in, the P site is where the peptide bond forms, and the E site is where the empty transfer RNA leaves the ribosome. Every time there's a new codon, there's a new transfer RNA that matches it and the peptide bonds form, and the polypeptide chain grows. The codon sequence determines which transfer RNA is going to be moving into the A site, carrying a new amino acid. When a stop codon is encountered, translation will stop, because there's no transfer RNA that carries an amino acid for the stop codon sequences. Then the protein will start folding, and the ribosome will come apart. So I'm gonna give you a strand of DNA. Okay, DNA is double-stranded, so there's two strands. Remember that there's a sense strand and an antisense, okay, or a coding strand and a template strand. So the template strand is what is used by RNA polymerase to produce the messenger RNA molecule. Okay, so remember also that DNA has a five prime end and a three prime end. And when we make RNA, that has to be anti-parallel. So if you start at the five prime end, the opposite strand will be three prime. And if you start with a three prime end on the DNA, then the opposite, the RNA molecule is gonna begin with a five prime end. It's always anti-parallel. Then when you produce your messenger RNA, and in this example, we'll assume that there's no RNA processing. Okay, so now we have our messenger RNA molecule. You break up every three nucleotides into codons, and then look at the genetic code and figure out the amino acid sequence. So on the next screen, when I show you the sequence, and I'll give you a genetic code, pause the video and see if you can figure out what the protein sequence will be. Were you able to figure out the protein sequence? So let's have a look at how we would figure this out. We have a template strand and a coding strand. The template strand is what RNA polymerase uses for transcription to produce the messenger RNA molecule, and it will be anti-parallel. So the messenger RNA molecule sequence is going to be 5' prime A U, because remember, messenger RNA does not have thymines, it has uracils, AUG, CUU, UCA, CGC, GAG, GGU, UAG, 3 prime. So we make the messenger RNA molecule by finding the complementary nucleotides to the template strand of the DNA.
Now that we have our messenger RNA and we've broken it up into our three nucleotide codon sequences, now we read the genetic code and we look for what amino acid is going to coincide with each of those codons. So remember that the genetic code contains the codons, the tRNAs carry the anticodons that will be complementary to the codons. So here was our RNA sequence and we break it up into our codons. So let's just look at the genetic code and look at the first two codons. So we have AUG and CUU. So our first two codons were AUG and CUU. So we look for the first codon along this axis. Here's the A column. AUG is going to code for methionine. CUU, here's the C column. Here's the U column. CUU is going to code for leucine. So did you get this protein sequence? Okay, now you know how to translate messenger RNA into proteins. There's just a couple other things that I want to mention. With prokaryotes, bacterial cells, they don't have a nucleus. So transcription and translation happens in the same place. So they have a nucleoid region where their DNA is located, but once transcription occurs and there's a messenger RNA, it can immediately go to a ribosome. Remember that bacteria don't have membrane-bound organelles. Ribosomes are not membrane-bound organelles. So all living organisms, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, have ribosomes for translating proteins. The other thing that I want to mention is in our cells, in eukaryotic cells, we have another organelle in the cell called Golgi bodies. And Golgi bodies are where proteins can be modified. So once translation finishes, if the ribosome was on the endoplasmic reticulum, that protein will be formed in a vesicle that will move to the Golgi, and then in the Golgi, that protein can be modified in some way. So for example, we can make lipoproteins, which are fats attached to the protein. For example, our LDL and HDL molecules that help transport fats through the bloodstream, they are lipoproteins. We could also add sugars and we can form glycoproteins. So a glycoprotein would be, for example, cell markers like our blood types, our A, B, um, O blood types. Those markers are glycoproteins. And then lastly, we need a few ingredients. We can't make proteins completely if we're missing any amino acids. So remember that we have 20 amino acids, but nine are essential. Those essential amino acids have to come from our diet. So you need to consume protein. Our body breaks it down into amino acids, and then our cells have a pool of amino acids that can combine with those transfer RNAs. So let's suppose you have a workout. You go to the gym or you go for a bike ride, and now you need to repair your muscles. You need to build new proteins. Okay, we need to make sure that we have consumed protein after a workout so that your muscle cells have the fuel and the substrates to be able to make actin and myosin and the other kinds of proteins in your muscles. So consuming protein is important. The other thing that's important is we need energy. Making proteins is an energy consuming process. And what foods give us energy? Carbohydrates. So the best time to have your highest carbohydrate meal of the day is after a workout because your muscles will use it to make energy for building proteins. And then lastly, there's a few hormones that are involved in stimulating protein synthesis. So growth hormone will stimulate protein synthesis and growth hormone also stimulates insulin-like growth factors, which are produced by the liver. And then we have our steroid hormones, the sex hormones, which includes testosterone and estrogen and also DHEA. They will also promote protein synthesis. And then insulin, insulin is important because it prevents the breakdown of proteins. So when you eat food after exercising, you make insulin. Eating food stimulates insulin and insulin tells the cells to take up those nutrients and it will prevent protein breakdown. 
When we are building proteins, this is an anabolic process. When we break down proteins, that is catabolic. 